All right, so here we go. So today I'm talking with Madeline Claire Wise, the author of Getting to Great, a five-step strategy for work and life. Madeline is a licensed psychotherapist, board-certified executive career and life coach who helps people master their minds so they can enjoy satisfaction and success in work, play, love, and life. So first of all, thank you for coming back, Madeline. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Happy to be. Absolutely. And I love your motto here on the back that you, you help people, you know, master their minds to enjoy satisfaction and success in work, play, love and life. It's such a such an awesome theme to live by and uh, great work to be involved with. Um, so before we actually dive into the book, I, I we were just talking about how crazy these times are. Uh, with COVID pandemic, changing jobs, changing relationships, um, you know, our activity, all the social interaction we used to know as, as typical has completely changed. And I read about, you know, depression rates and things like that going through the roof. Is that, is that your take? How do you see that? Like, like what are the, what are the causes or, yeah. or is that... To be perfectly honest, which I always am, um, as far as I know, it's almost unpopular to say that that's, that's not how everybody feels. And in fact, um, I've mentioned to you that I uh, write a blog post every week and I find some data that I think um, bears on who we are and how it matters in everyday life. And one of those posts said, and I forget what the percentage is, but it was a pretty high percentage of people who thought life was good. And it's it's like almost hard to sort of get out of the mouth because so many people are suffering. But um, that doesn't, yeah, but that, that doesn't apply to everyone. So did that address your question? Yep. Yeah. So, and you, and you talk about the suffering state yes. in the book, what is like, and that there are a couple different, couple different aspects of suffering. Yeah. Right. And some of it, maybe the most hurtful is in our mind. It's the things we do our do to ourselves, our perce- perception of life, perception of influence, actions we can or cannot take, right? Um, can you explain the suffering state yeah, so a bit? I got that from the Buddha. I, I study, have been studying for over like 20, 25 years, Eastern philosophy. And what I learned was that the Buddha had these two arrows. And the first arrow is the thing that happened. And that's painful. So that's pain. And that is there for as long as it's there and it goes away. Or like a, a potential traumatic yeah. event. Yeah. Or and it, it subsides. The second arrow is what you were saying. It's what the mind makes of the what happened. And the idea there is that that can last all day, all week, all month, all year, for the rest of your lives, tormenting, people tormenting themselves. And that is suffering. And that we do all by ourselves. And there's a uh, neuroscientist, Robert Sapolsky, who says that, excuse me, humans are the only ones who can create that kind of suffering. So the title of his book is when zebras don't, why zebras don't get ulcers. And so like, if it's time for lunch for a zebra, the zebra gets its lunch and we're done. It doesn't go, 
oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. I'm going to be having a big dinner and I'm eating too much of that anyway. And I thought I was going to be cutting back on carbs. And now I just had this big sandwich. And I just, zebras don't do that. So he, he says that humans do all this created suffering. And what it does is it keeps the cortisol level pretty high, which is very damaging to our internal organs and our mental states and our immune systems and all kinds of stuff. I actually have an episode that I did early on on cortisol and the effects of elevated cortisol in the body over time, right? It's supposed to spike in, in moments of stress or anxiety and then go back to right. a normal level. Right. And if you maintain any sort of high level cortisol over a, a long period of time, it has all the opposite effects. It has health yeah, problems, everything. like all everything. kinds of problems associated with it, right? And so that's associated with our our induced suffering state, um, and that could come from kind of anything, right? I mean, in a world of endless opportunity, we could cause ourselves anxiety or dissatisfaction or whatever just because there's so much to choose from and so difficult so many difficult choices to make well the thing is there's strategies all these things that are tormenting us like the tyranny of time is one of the chapters um those things were put there evolved over time because they they served us in some way so like time the concept of time which is by the way a figment and creation of the human imagination but it was put there to bring order to things to be able to keep track of the seasons so you know when to plant and you know when to harvest and all kinds of good things like that it was never supposed to be in charge of us we were always supposed to be in charge of it same thing with money. <laughs> money was not supposed to be in charge of us. We were supposed to use it for our betterment at our pleasure or for our survival. But because they're so ingrained, they get, they're like tools in a toolkit and they get overused and we don't even know we're doing it. So I like to, when, when I'm you know working with a client about one or another of those things that is that the mind is using to cause them suffering with I wanted to say that that way um, the idea is that's a strategy it's a part of you that is really trying to help it's just there's a time and a place and a way and a measure and we need to master our minds so that we're in charge of how that tool gets used. So it's not driving the bus. It's not running your life. Right. You've, I've heard you say, uh, like a good psychotherapist is, is one that knows which tool to use. Yes. At the, the, you know, depending on the scenario, right. And we kind of need to have that right. same mentality about ourselves, right. Who's driving the ship? What tool do I need to pull out at this time to make a good decision? Am I using logic or is this all kind of just made up or, you know, am I addressing the fears appropriately? Uh, what are the real barriers? Let me tell you why I'm laughing here. Because as I mentioned to you in the green room, I've gotten very interested in decision-making and um, decision-making myths. One of them is that decisions are supposed to be logic, not emotion. And that's a myth. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm really glad you said that. Yes. I'm yeah, because a lot of this. people think that. So there's this Psych 101 example of the guy who, uh, what, what's his name? Um, Phineas, Phineas Gage. I think he fell on a train track and got a spike in his head somewhere in the frontal lobe and it knocked out his emotion center. And they said he seemed perfectly normal and logical, but his judgment was kaput. 
And then there's another study I read where there was this doctor, I may have mentioned this to you before when we chatted, there's this doctor who had the same injury. He couldn't get dressed in the morning because he couldn't figure out what pants to put on because he had no preferences. He had no emotional reaction to, I really feel like wearing these today. I really don't feel like wearing those. So he just sort of be paralytic in daily functions because he had no access to how he felt about anything. And so there's, um, and this is on one of my recent blog posts at MadelineMoist.com that cognition is significantly impaired without the emotional data. So data is not a directive, it's information. So here's the hand model of the brain. Did we do that last time we chatted? Oh, I don't think this is so. good. Okay. This is the emotional center in here. Okay. And when this thing is freaking out like this, it knocks the whole frontal part of the brain, the higher executive functioning brain offline. But when we do those three little breaths that are in the book and everywhere else about me, when we do those <laughs> and we stimulate the polyvagal nerve, this is in less than, folks, less than 30 seconds with and you and I can do it to illustrate it too. What it does is it stimulates the polyvagal nerve, which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which takes you out of fight, flight, freeze, and allows this, the higher functioning back online. So everything is now integrated. And this can say to the higher brain centers, I'm not sure I like what's going on here. And I wanted you to know, can you help? And this says back, thank you for sharing. I got it from here. And then your higher decision making comes from the smartest part of your brain with the input that is necessary from here. And you can, you can get that up there in three breaths. So. Three breaths, you can bring it back to homeostasis integration integration gotcha i'm actually reading the book why we sleep where they talk about the various aspects of the brain affected by sleep and it describes a, a, you know similar ideas to what you're describing here where it's like you need like the prefrontal cortex acts as almost like the gas or brake pedal for the emotions center uh -huh. of the brain when you when you don't get enough sleep that is almost removed and so that you become m much more reactionary and emotional because the the pedals have been removed you know what i mean and then you get you get enough sleep over a few days and that prefrontal cortex is working as it should and you've kind of got the whole system at play again. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm a big fan of sleep. Right. I, there's actually a portion in your book where you mention it that you gotta have, you gotta have enough I'm glad. enough sleep. And uh, <laughs> so, all right, let's let's jump into this. So the way you organize the book, first of all, it's built on your your title is an acronym. Great, G R E A T, and um, those are sort of the the system you've found or developed to help people yeah the five step strategy i want to tell you how that was derived i didn't i didn't like um think it up and then start using it it didn't happen like that what happened was my uh, background and training is so diverse with a business degree and psychoanalytic dynamics training and NLP and philosophy and evolutionary psychology and brain science and you name it. So 
there's a lot of tools in there. And then I noticed that my clients were also different one from the other in age and gender and occupation and ethnicity. So at some point when I noticed, I mean, I've had people say to me, I'm so happy now, I almost can't stand it. So I really love hearing that because the whole idea is to get the uh, work and life working together in a way that puts that smile on their faces and their families and all of that. So I asked myself, what is working here? What is it? Because it was, it was hard to tell because it, it wasn't necessarily a certain kind of client and it wasn't necessarily a particular tool that I could identify. So, because like you said, it's kind of an organic thing to know which intervention to use to guide at any time. So I said to myself, what is going on here that is having such a nice result? And from that, I derived this five step strategy, the five steps that everyone seemed to be going through, no matter who they were and no matter what I was doing. And then of course, you can only imagine how thrilled I was to see that it worked into the acronym great, which I loved. <laughs> how perfect. Right. Which goes, which goes perfectly with what we started with your, you know, helping people succeed in love and life and all that. Right. So the, the principles here are the steps I should say are grounding, grounding in the belief that a great life is possible through a great environmental fit then recognizing that fitness begins with the and requires knowing who we are our internal and environments then exploring out of the block box alternatives and possibilities and external environments then number four is acting on a new environmental vision because there is no success without action and then lastly tackling the mind's normal natural resistance to change so it doesn't get in the way so that's the acronym. That's the that's the basis of the book. It, through the book, you've you've got a section with subtitles that explore an idea, or uh, uh, and then you have a case example, and then an exercise, and and they all end with an exercise to help the reader improve their lives without have you know going to the psychotherapist. So my favorite exercise, I got to <laughs> tell you, is the one about money. Did you see that? I did. So well, we got to talk besides about Besides the power breathing one, <laughs> which I think is the essence of everything. And if nobody um, remembers another word I've said, please remember that. Those, those three little breaths are life changing. But there's this other exercise at the end of the chapter on money, which is like amazing. So let's get let's go to the money part because I I absolutely loved it. So first of all, one of the quotes that you start with says, "The real measure of your wealth is how much you'd be worth if you lost all your money." Right? So first of all, money is a key piece of our lives, but there are so many versions of success and wealth and satisfaction and all this, right? And so um so you could twist that quote in so many directions to say like, what is real wealth? What would you be worth if you lost all your money? Right. I actually posted that on Instagram when I read it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next piece that, that I loved and shared with my wife was, um, let's see, let me read it. A psychotherapist and money relationships author, Olivia Mellon suggested imagining that your money and you are being interviewed on Oprah about your relationship. <laughs> now, so many people have a really hard time with their money relationship, right? So people call it money blueprint or, or their money management. Shame. And, on and they don't even know it. it. Right. Some probably are just like completely oblivious to it. Others are absolutely afraid of it. Yeah, but they don't. Right. 
I don't think a lot of people, which is why I love this exercise, I don't think a lot of people think of it as that it's a separate entity and they're having a relationship with it. They just know that maybe they're upset about it or they're happy about it, but I don't think they think of it that way. And when I did that, I did that exercise years ago. I really think, I really think it profoundly changed my life. Maybe I'm making too much out of it, but that's what I think. I don't think you are. I, I have uh, been obsessed oddly with finance for a long time. I think I mentioned to you last time that I, I would ask for stock for Christmas <laughs> when I was a teenager. I'm impressed. Um, so I've always loved to study finance. However, I, I, I've passed up on really high paying jobs and opportunities just because my main priority was like family and freedom. Okay. Uh, so when I did this exercise, I actually felt pretty solid about my relationship with money. Would you, um, would it be too personal for you to share what your money said to you? Uh, I'd have to go back through and, and, and rewrite it down or whatever, but, um, you don't have to, but I thought it would be fun if it's okay. And you could, I can tell you mine. <laughs> okay. Let's hear it. Let's start with yours. Let's hear it. My money said on the talk show, the Jerry Springer show or whatever, or Oprah. Or... <laughs> we'll go with Oprah. My money, or Dr. Phil, my money yeah. said, you do not enjoy me. You ignore me. <laughs> you just let me sit there. You don't ever do anything with me. And it really hurts my feelings because I'm here for you. Interesting. And that, I think, has been a theme. And something happened where over the years, I, I think because of that, it's true. It was sitting there and I was like, not like this. So I'm not going to feel any abundance like that because I'm ignoring the whole thing. So right. I was living, you know, they talk about scarcity mode and the abundance mode and all of that. I think I really was living more in scarcity than made sense given the amounts. And over the years, somehow, and I, I know this sounds like a little woo woo, I think that the amounts have actually increased because of the mind shift. Now, everybody talks about that. They talk about mindset and that it has to begin there. And I think I might be an example because because it has changed and it still is it's like getting better and better yeah in my observation i think that's um that's pretty common and then there's the other kind of extreme where people are um they just th think it grows on trees and they spend it all and they're constantly in a yeah a hole and you know both of them cause kind of a wedge a bit of a so what do you think the money would say on the dr phil show to them to, to them or to me well to them for the people who spend it you know that you don't respect me ah there you go good or you you know you don't use my skills you don't utilize me in the way i was meant to be used um you you waste me or abuse you know, abuse yeah yeah. So, so I think there's a balance for this whole relationship or utilization of money, right? It's like, it's there for your, of course, basic needs. Um, it's Which also how it started. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an IOU. It's, it's a piece of paper that says I'm, you know, I'm a piece of gold and you can use me for, <laughs> to buy something from the blacksmith or some food. Or a chicken, yeah. Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you need to use your money uh, for positive growth, but it's also there for enjoyment, play, 
satisfaction. Well, right? it was supposed to be, if you go back to early times of humanity, it was supposed to be a means to an end, you know, bartering, and then it all got too complicated and they started doing hash marks on, you know, a piece of stone, and then it became beads or whatever it was, but it was it was for a purpose. It it wasn't for its own sake. And I think that's where we got a little screwy about money. Yeah, now money runs the conversation. If you say the word success, mm. it's money. It's money, right? But that's not real success. I mean, it's an aspect, but it's not. Did you see the, the Warren Beatty quote in there? I think I might have put it. I'm not sure. You'll have to remind me. I'm sure I read it, but I don't know. It's a great quote. It is, you know that you're successful when you, when you can't tell whether you're working or playing. Yes. And I love that. And of course, sometimes the work that I do can be, you know, sad, but it still has that quality of privilege and pleasure to be on the journey with people and if you think of a work as like hard labor, it never feels like that to me. It yeah. always feels like a privilege and a pleasure. So you, you found you found an activity or human interaction that fulfills you. That you're serving others and being served together. I feel like yes indeed. I feel thank you for saying that. I feel like I have what so many people come to me looking for, for themselves. So when we say grounding in the belief, they don't necessarily believe really that it's possible to get there. They just want some of the pain to stop. But I know that it's possible. You know, the first line of the book, a great life depends on a great fit between who we are and the environments in which we work and live. And that, mm -hmm. I mean, Darwin knew that, <laughs> that the world belongs to those best adapted to their environments. What's interesting and important for humans is that we get to create those environments. We get to pick those environments. We get to say, I want to be in that environment, not in that environment. And some of those were well adapted for, and some of them were not. But we get to create the world we live in and knowing that is um, pretty powerful. Do you think the problem for some of these people that you're saying they're in a suffering state and from the quote you just said, the way you started your book, um, do you think a lot of them are in a sort of stuck in a mindset that there's a destination I need to get to to have a great life versus I need to make the journey a great life? Like the, the sort of the infinite game kind of mindset where it's like, a great life to me is to be on a path that I enjoy, not necessarily on a path that's difficult, painful, and suffering to get somewhere. You know what I mean? You get what I'm saying? I think um, I want to say both. So there's this thing about that I learned in my uh, philosophy studies that's called the working surface. And if you put Mastering the mind, by the way, is getting as much in charge of the placement of your attention as you possibly can. When people place their attention on exactly what they're doing, like the paintbrush on the woodwork, when you're, or the knife when you're cutting the tomato, you put your attention right there. The mind, which wanders 70% of the time into the past regrets, or future worries isn't doing that. And in the present moment, which you hear about all the time, but if you, if, if people play with this exercise, you'll see it to be true. And if your attention is on the present moment, not in the past regrets or the future worries, everything is pretty fine. And so if we keep our focus on that working surface, of whatever it is, whether it's reading to one of your kids or what washing the dishes, the sponge on the dish, 
It doesn't matter. But the reason that I say both is because I believe the tree wants to grow and the bird wants to fly. And so do we. And when we, and I'm sure this is truer for some people than for others, but when we feel that we're not growing, that we're not shooting for something out there, I think humans get um, stagnant and demoralized. There's this, there's this wonderful Yale study that showed that um, when people were not, they said optimal learning took place 70% outside, 70% comes up for everything, by the way. I don't know why that is, but anyway, 70%, no, I noticed in a whole bunch of my blocks, blogs, it kept saying 70%, it's like, why? But anyway, they say that optimal learning is 70% outside of your comfort zone. And the reason for that, they said, was that if you're not outside of your comfort zone, the brain thinks everything's chill and the brain doesn't like to waste energy. So it just kind of shuts down the learning centers and there's a lot of motivation and excitement when the learning centers are turned on. So if somebody's not learning anything and they're not growing and there's no novelty, it's kind of blah in there. And then, then what happens, what I've seen, what I found is that people start blaming it on the spouse or blaming it on the job. And then they make things worse than they really are. And because maybe what they are is bored right. and they need to grow. So I do think we need to be planted in the present moment so that we're not in past regrets and future worries. But I also think with that, and there's no reason not to be able to have both, there needs to be something that you're growing toward. Right. Um, Makes sense. Um, yeah. Makes sense. So you need both. You need the vision of a, a brighter future, but also uh, a, to be grounded in like the, the pathway is part of it, right? The, the journey I'm in today is well, also to be in, enjoyed. Or When you say brighter, it's almost like putting down the present. I, I want to say new. Gotcha. So there may, there may have been nothing wrong with where right. you are. It might be perfectly fine, but you've been there for a long time and the brain needs novelty. Exactly. So the boredom is, is, is a, yeah. So you need excitement, need new. Gotcha. New. To feel, like to feel alive. And, I like that. and it doesn't really mean that anything is wrong, except that something new is needed. And Perfect. People do outgrow environments that once worked. Yeah, I've, I've lived that for sure. Yeah, for sure. and it isn't that anybody's bad or wrong. It's just that I find that in my work all the time. Um, one of my clients told me the other day that Is he- that why I, I jump jobs every like two or three years? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> And everybody's doing that now, right? Yeah. It's not like the 1950s. <laughs> there, I, I started to tell you, there's a man that I'm working with who's doing um, business in South America. He lives here now in South America where um, his family actually lives. And one of the things that's really fun in my work is that we're sort of grinding away at whatever the mental model is that's in the way in general. And then often they'll say, oh, by the way, I'm sleeping and I didn't even know that I wasn't, or oh, by the way, we're all moving to South America. It isn't anything that we worked on, but it was. it's just this eruption of some fantastic new thing that is happening. So he said, he actually, it was, it was very dear 
because he said something like, you know, you really do transform lives. And he and his wife, who were kind of drifting a little bit, um, are very excited and decided together. And now they have this new project where they're moving the whole family. And it's like a really thrilling new, new thing. Right. A new vision, a new experience, a new goal, a new challenge. And they're sharing it. Yeah. So like everything's connected, which is why I say work, play, love, and life, because everything's connected to everything else. And if you're really um, feeling um, dissatisfied in one area of your life, it's kind of hard for that not to get on everything. So, Right. Um, you reminded me of a section of the book. I'm trying to find it now. Um, too many things. Oh, well. Well. We'll move on to another one, but I think that is that is really a great way to put it. That we're looking for something new, even if the past was great, we've we've kind of outgrown it, and we want yeah. something. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on on this piece, um, where you said that. Joseph Grenny's study of a thousand managers found that 97% had at least one career limiting habit. Mm. And then even when they knew about it, they kind of clung to it. They, like, it's almost like we wanted to, they wanted to keep their defect, their imperfection or whatever. And I know that's an interesting concept to a lot of people, even though we all kind of fall into that category to a degree. Right. And, and it made me wonder like, why do people cling to uh, like familiarity over health? Because it has worked to some extent and it becomes a part of their identity. It's who they are. Um, there was somebody a colleague, he wasn't a client of mine, yesterday who was explaining to me, and this is a career limiting belief if there ever was one. And by the way, this is common. He was explaining that because of COVID um, and he, he couldn't be with people in person and therefore his business was suffering. And I said, May I tell you a little story? And he said, of course. I said, okay. I was on one of these networking calls. There were two people who were in the exact same line of work. And one of them said that, you know, this is an in-person business and it has to be like face-to-face -face in the same room. And he was so depressed and was making no money and just was like hanging his head. It was the saddest thing. And then this other guy said, that's funny. I just had the best year I ever had. But this guy's on the phone all day long saying hi to all these people who were sitting around trying to figure out whether the world was coming to an end. And he just got on there and schmoozed with them and made a killing. And they do the exact same thing. So when you talk about a career limiting belief, when I said that to the guy yesterday, I felt like exactly what you just said, like that it was taking something fundamental away from him to dispel that myth. Changing his identity as who he is or who he sees himself as. Yeah, probably has a lot in there. Like he's a people person and people really take to him. And this is how he built his business so far. And it's like a whole thing. It's huge. So what happens if someone just takes that away from you? Right. The fear, the fear of change. Right. But then, he, then, then he has to get on the phone like the other guy. He has to take on a new identity that he doesn't know yet. That he doesn't, doesn't yet know. And he has to do things that maybe are outside of his comfort zone. Gotcha. 
So, so another phrase from your book, very different section says, a shame filled people tend not to grow more often. It keeps you safe and stuck, <laughs> right? It's like, do you think it's a, what we were talking about this guy, you not wanting to change for his business or perceiving that, you know, things, um, are, are going downhill. Do you think it's attached to shame or is it simply just, uh, you know, this is my identity and I don't know the, the unknown. Is it both? No, I, you're reminding me that I used to do, this is going to sound like it's not related, but I think it is. I used to do rape crisis intervention. Okay. And at the time period of my life that I was doing that, when, I think I was in training when I was, when I was doing that, I also came upon this book. And I think it might've been Eric Erickson who had those stages of development also from Psych 101. And what he said was the thing that causes people the most shame is feeling like they hadn't been able to take care of themselves. And what that connected to in the rape crisis work that I was doing is that every one of the women talked about some way in which she should have handled it better. Hmm. These were victims who were taking it on themselves that they should have done something better. I won't even give you the examples. They yeah. were, they were, they were startling to me. Um, yeah, I mean, there was one that makes sense. Yes, yeah, she shouldn't be out in the middle of the city by herself drunk at two in the morning. But that's, that's not the kind of example that, um, that I'm talking about. There were other, other kinds of examples. So I think, I think when people are buried by the weight of the shame, that they're not doing a good job, that the business isn't making enough revenue, that they're not really home for their children enough or whatever it is, or when they are home, they are distracted. There is so much shame in that, that, that people then have to cope with their shame and all kinds of energy and men mentating goes into that. So, so that's what I have to say about that much. What's your thought? So the, sh the shame could be keeping people stuck, but, but is it, is it always shame or is it, compl is it, is it, could it be fear of the unknown? Oh, for sure. So when we talk about imposter syndrome, so there's this wonderful article I may or may not have referenced, but I really loved it because the, the author said, if someone is going someplace they've never been before and they're not afraid or they're not feeling like an imposter, like maybe they don't have the stuff, we would worry about them more. What kind of arrogance does it take to think it's a slam dunk at something you never did before? So of course, when people are going out of their comfort zone, they can feel afraid because that's normal. Gotcha. You, just, you just don't want, you don't want shame driving the bus. You don't want fear driving the bus. All those feelings are allowed to be there and they should be respected. Um, I'm trying to think there's a Rumi wrote a wonderful poem called the guest house. That's like how you wake up every morning and there they are, all the feelings. And he uh, wrote something about how you invite them in for tea. And they're all there to help you and to teach you something. But I'm saying, and people like me say, they just can't drive the bus. That's all. <laughs> gotcha. Recognize them, acknowledge them. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then make your... They, they are precious parts of us. We wouldn't be here to talk about them without them. Right. They are integral and precious parts of us. 
and they, uh, I think, are to be, I want to say loved. But just like your kids, they're not, they're not running the house. Right. You know? So. At least hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody told me when I first started studying philosophy, one of the tutors said that the mind is like a two-year-old who's winning. <laughs> nice. Yeah. A two-year-old that's winning. Sometimes they win. Oh. Right. right. I got four kids. I don't know if I don't know if you knew that I had the entire circus. I, I somehow for some reason thought you had two. I didn't know you had four. Holy moly. Four. Yeah, I'm just running myself ragged. <laughs> no, they're adorable, though. Um, okay, so this next section I want to jump to, it's, it's under the Controlling Your Mouth, I believe is the title of the, the chapter. Uh, many subtitles under that, but I'll read this, this one partial paragraph. It says, I happen to think that talking is altogether overrated as a cure-all for everything that ails us. Within within and between us. For example, talking over and over again about one's trauma at some point only strengthens the neural connections associated with trauma, keeping the trauma alive and firing over and over again, rather than easing the strength of it for us. So um, this came on the back of you talking about, you know, some, some therapists, there's many strategies, I guess, but like, you know, sometimes it's like, let's talk about something. Some people say like, ignore it act like it didn't exist and just try and build new a new life a new belief whatever right and and you're you're maybe somewhere in between i am right yes i wouldn't as we were saying about feelings we don't we don't diss them we honor them but I like to think about it as a garden, like the brain as a garden. I even have a post on that. So what I like to, did you ever hear the story about the little boy asks the grandfather, he says there are two wolves, the good wolf and the bad wolf, and they're fighting and which one's going to win? And the grandfather says the one you feed. Right. So I like to think, of the brain as a garden and you water it and you nourish it and you tend it, you take care of it, these new habits and these new ways of being. And this old garden will like go to seed, the connections, every everything will get weaker and this will get stronger. Now, when that first begins, I also think the old kind of fights for its life. So things that might be troubling fight back a little harder. But when we take our belly breaths and we get centered, I think that's a nice way to. So it isn't to ignore it. It's to note it, take note of it, and then bring your mind back to your new garden, your new way of being, yeah. your, your present and your future. Take some time to understand or vent or like identify emotions, feelings, moments, but then what's your new future? What are you, <clears throat> what are your new habits, your new perspectives? Yeah. Spend more time on that. Yeah. Just keep, taking the mind and putting it over there. I've even said to people about the old stuff that seems to plague them. I've even said to them, how many minutes a day would you like to spend on that? And then one um, experiment or exercise is to actually come up with, okay, a half an hour of day. And then you like force yourself to do it. Hmm. And then you don't really want to. As much. <laughs> that's a, that's a like, very creative. It's like a power struggle going on between you and your intrusive thoughts. So one way to win that 
is to use like a paradox where you just say, okay, fine, you're here. You get to be here for 30 minutes, go. Enter the pain ring, yeah. And then I think more often than not, it would all start to seem kind of silly. Yeah. And so I love, I love that idea. That's a very interesting concept to, to say, yeah, we're going to enter the pain ring for 30 minutes. And after a few days, you're just going, this is miserable. I would rather live the other life. <laughs> also, I think, I think it would get to, this is stupid. Yeah. It's not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my energy. It's putting me in, in a bad state. Like, I'd rather focus on the the new opportunities, the things I'm excited about in life. Very cool. So, so one one thing that you talk about in pretty great detail is good company. Yeah. You know, we spoke about this last time, but but now that I've read the way you put it. Uh, in one particular phrase that I wanted to read says, and now you know why I say work-life quality instead of work-life balance, which is a word that we hear all the time, work-life balance, work-life balance. But you say that balance sounds too much like it implies equal allocation of times for this, this part of life and that, which is which I do not believe is the best way to nourish one's being. It's like, work-life quality how do you improve quality through good company mm. i repeat the first line of the book great life depends on a great fit between who we are and the environment in which we work and live so we have um, a lot of freedom more than we think to pick and choose like you can't pick and choose your parents necessarily but but the rest, I don't think, you know, people are making 35,000 decisions a day that they don't even know about. And those decisions pertain to a lot of them, who does and does not get into our life. Those dis And good company, as we, I think, were saying before, is not just about the people. It's very much about the people, but it's not just about the people. It's the food we decide to eat, the music we decide to listen to, the books we decide to read. And here's, here's the best. The thoughts we decide to entertain in our head. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to tie that last thought to that. It's like, how much time are you going to spend with the brighter, brighter things in your brain, right? The, the thoughts that we have about the good things in life, the entertainment we provide to ourselves and to others and, yeah. and partake of. By the way, when, I just want to say, when the uh, not so bright thoughts come, I do not recommend, um, again, dismissing them. I have a question that I like. The question is this. Is there something to be done here? Okay. I feel like dog do about whatever it is. Is there something to be done here? And sometimes there is, but not today. Or sometimes there is, but not by you. Or sometimes there is, but you already did it. And sometimes there isn't. And then you just take your breaths and help it to, to pass. But... I don't just dismiss, I, I don't think, I think negative thoughts are helpful too. It's not just that we respect them because they deserve to be there. They're helpful. They are is data. They're is it the, the nature of the thought? So like if it's, if it's something reoccurring that I did something wrong to somebody else and it's just, it's just tormenting me. Is there something to be done? Well, yes, maybe there is. I can go perfect. take action, right? If there was just, if I'm just beating myself up about something that seems completely irrational and, and just this shame just overwhelms me and whatever, it's like, why do I entertain this thought? It's sort of a, a made up falsehood about myself. 
um, maybe I'm just creating more pain for no reason. I don't know if that was a good example, but um, well, it is. It is okay. So sometimes people shame themselves to get in there before someone else does. Sometimes people shame themselves to keep themselves safe. Like you're not, you're not really good enough for that, and then it keeps you from going out of your comfort zone. So that's why that question is so important. Like, is there something to be done here? And sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. But if you pause and take your three breaths, kick it upstairs to your higher brain and have your higher brain figure out, is there something to be done here? Or did you already do it? Or is there nothing to be done? And then I just read a study the other day about people feel good when they know that they put the right amount of attention on a decision or a problem. And that question, I think, really gives you that pause and focus to pay the right attention. Is there something to be done here? And there is or there isn't. And right. then you're done. And then you take the action step that's next. And sometimes the action step is just to breathe and let it go like a cloud in the sky or a leaf floating down the river. Right. <laughs> That's nice. Well said. Um, okay. A couple more things and we'll, we'll shut this down. So um, you discuss how people change and you actually go to other, a couple of other um, therapists writings to discuss this and, that people just change they just do but you got to change something right like implement change whether it's your shoelaces or your behavior or something right and the thought that came to my head as i was kind of reading this is like like sometimes we put so much effort into like stopping a behavior which maybe there's merit to that but if we can shake up some of these other easier things maybe that would lead to a new opportunity that could help change, right? Changing the model. This is another concept in your book, like replace it with a new model instead of just like fighting the evil source, right? It's like, like let's change things up, change the, the way our room is, is decorated. Change. I the know what you're referring to. You're referring to that Buckminster Fuller quote, I think that yeah. says that, you never uh, accomplish change or whatever by getting rid of the old model. You create a new one that makes the old one obsolete. And that is exact. When I read that, I thought, my God, that is that garden thing right. that you create the new one and the old one just withers. So there's a Goldilocks principle. I don't know whether that's in there or not, but the Goldilocks principle is change management theory. So it's not too hot, not too cold, but just right. It's not too big, not too little, but just right. If so at the end of every session with me, there is at least one action step that is derived by the client in the context of whatever we have been working on for that session that would be relevant to the path that they're on toward that vision that you were talking about. And the steps have to be not so big that they're overwhelming because that shuts the system down, but not so, and this is what we were talking about, about the new, the brain loves new. So it has to be big enough that the brain systems take notice, huh? Something's going on here that triggers your motivational system. And then you want to take another step and another step because it felt good. So not too big because that'll shut you down and not too little because that'll do nothing also. But that sweet spot of some step along the right path for you that keeps you moving and growing and having a good time. Even though parts of it are scary because it's outside of the boundary. Sure. 
it's kind of the butterfly theory of like change something which will cause change in another thing which eventually you find yourself living a new you right yeah a new identity and new new behavior patterns new lifestyle you know the guidance for that i find bubbles up without any effort when we're quiet on the inside sometimes our internal lives can get so noisy so much self-talk so much fear so much worry so much all of that that we can't even hear our own guidance but i find that the quieter we get on the inside with with our breath work that um the what to do's just come up. I have a thing. If it comes up once, like to do, to take a big leap in, in work, play, love or life, whatever it is. If it, when it comes up once, I note it, if it seems like out of the comfort zone. And then if it comes up again, I start thinking, yeah, maybe. And take it um, seriously rather than squelch it, because that's why people get depressed, I think. They're squel- squelching their spirit. Interesting. That's a great method, right? So take note, first time, second time, third time, you really start investigating. Oh, it keeps coming back, I think. Okay. Let's go. Guess I'm going to get an MBA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's probably how that happens, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Madeline, it has been very fun talking to you. I really enjoyed the book. I love the idea of winning in life, both in, you know, in in work, play, love, and life. And um, the action steps were very helpful. I, I do use the three breaths frequently now as I'm juggling four kids work podcasts. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Teach them. I I do. My daughter and I read self-help books at night and we always, we always do the strategies we learn. So one book the other day I mentioned having a, taking time to do a gratitude list, list 12 12 things you're grateful for every day, right? 12? 12. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I've always heard it as three. That's a lot. 12, but it's nice. We go back and forth. We each do six. And then, oh, um, so cute. And then we do the, the, uh, the breathing, uh, and, and some meditation and stuff. So it's, it's great. I don't know whether you all have a chance to, uh, I don't know if people have a time and a way and a place to sit at a dinner table together, but if you do, my family used to really have a good time with doing our breaths before we actually started to eat. Hmm. And the fact, the fact that we did it will just made us laugh because we couldn't believe that we were doing it. And it really, it really just, it really just um, lightened and lifted and brightened everything. So I highly recommend that. I love that idea. I'll think we'll, we'll try it because it seems like the first of dinner is chaos and then eventually we get there, right? But maybe this would, <laughs> this would help no, us. No, it's a really, a really nice way to start it. Just And then after the breath, everybody smiles. So it's three breaths and a smile. Got it. We'll so, do that tonight. I, I think you're going to like it. Great. So the book is Getting to Great. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. Yes, you can. And there's the um, compatible online course. And if if people go to my website at MadelineWeiss.com, everything is on there. My social links are there. And there's a thing to click for the book and a thing to click for the online course. And I would love to hear from anybody who would like to chat with me about any of this or something else in their lives. So, And then they can sign up for your email list there where you do regular emails and your blog posts. Yes. And then uh, sign up for that online course. There's also... 
there's also free exercises there in a box that says something like complimentary mind management exercises. It's about halfway down. So there's a pull down. The, the exercise that I'm saying, if you do nothing else, do this, is called power breathing. Power breathing. And, right. it's, and it's just a simple one sheet on how to do it. So. Cool. And I'll put the link to purchase this book from Amazon in the show notes so that anyone that's listening can grab it there. So Madeline, thank you again. Appreciate it. Always fun to see you and thank you for having me.